In the last video, we designed a voltage regulator, but in this video, I want to talk more about what can go wrong with it. We're going to talk about overcurrent protection. Let's look back at the last example of the previous video. In that example, we designed a voltage regulator that could supply 12 volts from a variable DC supply. Here's the design that we came up with. The problem mentioned that the unregulated supply voltage varied around 19.5 volts by plus or minus 4.5 volts. That means that at the input, we have between 15 and 24 volts. If everything's working well, we ought to have 12 volts at the output. Since very little current goes down into our sampling network, almost all of the current through Q1 makes it to the load. In this video, I'm just going to neglect the current passing down into the sampling network. We're told in the problem that we had a maximum load current of a half an amp. Presumably, that's if everything is working well. But what happens if I short circuit it? What happens if I take the resistor out of the load and replace it with a short circuit? That could happen in the event of a fault, for example. What would happen to the circuit? Well, we estimated how much power the transistor would have to dissipate in order to keep from burning up in such a scenario. But that estimate was flawed a little bit. Let me show you how. Not only in the problem are we told what the maximum load current is, we're also told what the maximum output current of the op amp is. It's 3 milliamp. Since that all passes into the base of the transistor, this effectively is the maximum base current that the transistor would ever see. Since the maximum expected load current is a half an amp, we can now calculate what the minimum required beta is for the transistor. It works out to be 167. That's a very reasonable number for bipolar transistors beta. But the problem with the analysis in the last video is that we somehow assumed that this beta was accurate even if the transistor was short circuited. In other words, let's assume that we have the maximum base current passing into our transistor. However, if the beta of our transistor is actually larger than 167, then we're not going to have a half an amp passing out of the emitter of that transistor. We might have something more. Since I calculated the power dissipation of the transistor based on these two values, our transistor could actually burn up in the event of a short circuit. That is, if I bypass our load resistor with a wire and we assume that our source coming from the unregulated supply is at 24 volts, or the worst case scenario, then we'll have all 24 volts across transistor Q1. How much current will flow? Of course, that depends on the beta of the transistor and how the beta of the transistor varies with temperature and other things like that. But suffice it to say that this is a dangerous scenario. Whether the transistor burns up or not kind of depends on the characteristics of that particular bipolar transistor that's not good and we need to fix it. What we're going to do in the rest of this video is to show how we can limit the current in the event of a fault. I'm going to introduce a slight variation of the circuit that we just looked at. In this voltage regulator, we have overcurrent protection. It's identical to the circuit we just looked at except for these two circuit elements. I've added one resistor and another transistor to the circuit. They're in series between Q1 and the sampling network. To show how it works, I want to consider two different regions of operation. Let's think about how it ought to work when everything is working well, and then we'll think about how it works if I short circuit the load. Under normal operation, current enters the regulator from our unregulated supply. A little bit of it branches down here into RS, but I'm not going to worry about that. Most of the current continues on and passes through the collector of transistor Q1. Again, most of that current passes out of the emitter of transistor Q1. The beta of a transistor is usually a value over 100, so the base current passing up into transistor Q1 is typically very small relative to the current running horizontally along the top of this diagram. What then happens to the current when it exits Q1 through its emitter? Does it go through R3 or does it go down into the base of transistor Q2? Well, because the beta is usually large for transistors, this typically translates to small values of base currents. If everything is working well, the base current into a bipolar transistor in general ought not to be a very large current. So if everything's working well, we don't expect very much of this current to branch down into the base of Q2. We expect it to continue right through R3 and down into our load resistor. Again, I'm going to neglect the current that goes down through our sampling network, R1 and R2. One thing I'd like you to notice, though, is that the sampling network that controls the voltage is next to the load resistor. 
This is the voltage that's sampled and that's fed back into a feedback path in order to control the regulator. If the voltage at the output is too high, the negative feedback loop will still serve to reduce it. Likewise, if the output voltage is too low, the negative feedback loop will serve to increase it. The fact that I've added transistor Q2 and resistor R3 is not going to change the general operation of our regulator here. I do want to consider, however, the voltage across resistor R3. Let's label that V sub R. What we're going to do here is choose a value for R3 such that transistor Q2 is normally off. What do I mean when Q2 is off? Well, I mean that the base emitter voltage drop, that is the voltage from here to here, is less than the required voltage to turn on that diode. Now, if it's silicon transistor, it's going to turn on somewhere between about 0.6 volts and 0.7 volts. If I wanna make sure it's off, I'll pick 0.6 just to be sure. If I choose it so that it's less than 0.7, it might accidentally turn on. So let's pick 0.6 just to be on the safe side. I want VR to be less than 0.6 volts all the time. When is that voltage drop going to be the highest? Well, it's going to be the highest when my unregulated supply is at its maximum. So over here at the left, we have an unregulated supply. So that's going to vary, say, between V min and V max. The current coming from the unregulated supply is generally related to the voltage. If the voltage is a little bit higher, the current going into our circuit in general is going to be a little bit higher. The same thing is true with the current passing through resistor R3. If our supply voltage is at its max, that's when I can expect the largest current to pass through resistor R3. We've now identified our worst case scenario. VR is highest when my input voltage is at its maximum. What we're going to do now is to choose R3 based on the maximum load current I expect to be passing through it. After R3 is chosen, then it's a constant. It's fixed. The 0.6 volt across it, though, is not fixed. Let's write the equation to calculate the voltage drop across R3 in normal operation. That voltage drop is just our load current times R3. You see, if our load current is not at its maximum, then the voltage drop V sub R is going to be a number less than 0.6. And the fact that it's less than 0.6 is important because it means that the transistor Q2 is switched off. In the event that something goes wrong though, and our load current becomes a very high number, our voltage V sub R is going to be a number greater than 0.6. That's going to turn transistor Q to on because V sub R is just the base emitter voltage across transistor Q2. Before I discuss the short circuit situation, I wanna say a few words about the currents around Q2. If the load current is less than our maximum expected load current, then the base emitter junction voltage drop across transistor Q2, or equivalently V sub R, is going to be less than 0.6 volts, like I just mentioned. The transistor is going to be off, but what does it mean for a transistor to be off? Well, it means that there's not going to be current passing down through the collector of transistor Q2. That means that all of the current coming out of our op amp is available to go into Q1. That's important because we need transistor Q1 to be on under normal operation. Let's add that to our list here of what's going on in normal operation. Q1 is on because it has sufficient base current coming from the op amp to turn on. Now let's talk about what happens if we short circuit the load or if something goes wrong and causes the load current to rise up above our designed value. Since V sub R is directly related to our load current and resistor R3 is just a constant value, V sub R is going to exceed 0.6 volts. That's the base emitter junction of transistor Q2. If the transistor doesn't turn on immediately, it's going to turn on rather quickly and certainly before that base emitter voltage reaches 0.7 volts. What happens then to the currents when Q2 is on? When Q2 is on, current starts going through the base emitter junction, the base current in other words, and if the beta of transistor Q2 is appreciable, as it is in normal bipolar transistors, then we should have substantial current coming into the collector of transistor Q2. With substantial current coming into the collector of transistor Q2, we won't have very much current flowing into the base of transistor Q1 anymore. Because the current at the output of an op amp is typically limited by the capabilities of the op amp, the current going into the base of transistor Q1 is also going to be limited. With the base current being reduced, the collector current is also going to be reduced. 
That's the essence of how it works. Now let's return to the example that we looked at at the end of the last video. Let's finish up the example, so to speak, and make sure that this circuit really can handle a short circuit situation or an overcurrent situation. It was stated here in the problem that the maximum load current is going to be 500 milliamps, but the beta of the transistor wasn't stated in the problem. Let's make sure that indeed the circuit is only going to be able to give us a maximum load current of a half an amp by choosing R3. By choosing R3 at 1.2 ohms, we ensure that if the current coming through transistor Q1 and out through our load is less than the maximum load current of a half an amp, then Q2 will be off. What should the power rating be for resistor R3? Well, I'm going to use I squared R in order to calculate it. At most, we should have a half an amp flowing through it, and the resistor value that I just chose is 1.2 ohms. Of course, to be on the safe side, we might want to choose something a little bit higher than that, just in case transistor Q2 needs a little bit more of a voltage across its base emitter junction to turn on. In other words, we calculated everything through at 0.6 volts, but it might take a little bit more voltage than that in order to turn on transistor Q2. When transistor Q2 does turn on in the event of a fault, then the current from our op amp, instead of flowing into the base of Q1, will be diverted into the collector of transistor Q2, which will then limit the base current available for transistor Q1, which will then reduce the flow of the current through our load. What we've basically done here in this circuit is use transistor Q2 as a switch. We're switching it on or off depending upon the amount of current going through resistor R3. When the current passing through that resistor is large, we have a very large voltage drop across the base emitter junction and the transistor turns on. If we have a small current flowing through the resistor or a small base emitter junction voltage drop across the transistor, then the transistor turns off.